Space, the final frontier. This is the Observer's Notebook, the official podcast of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. Its mission to explore the solar system, to seek out new observations and data, to boldly go where no podcast has gone before. And now the host of the Observer's Notebook, Tim Robertson. Hello and welcome to episode 147 of the Observer's Notebook, the official podcast of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. I'm Tim Robertson, the host of the Observer's Notebook and also the coordinator of the training program within the ALPO. Thanks for downloading and listening. The ALPO collects and analyzes observations of various solar system bodies and associated phenomena, and publishes detailed reports concerning these bodies in its quarterly publication, The Journal of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. This podcast depends upon donations from you, our listeners, to keep it alive. If you enjoy what you hear on the podcast, you can donate to it via Patreon. You could start off by giving just $1 a month. If you feel even more generous, for $5, you receive early access to the podcast before it goes public. For a monthly donation of $10, you receive a copy of the Novice Observer's Handbook. And for $35 a month, you receive producer credits on the podcast and one year's membership to the Alpo. You can help us out by going to www.patreon.com slash Observer's Notebook. And if you'd like to join the Alpo, membership begins at only $18 a year. Find out more at www.alpo-astronomy.org. And we're also on Facebook. Just search for ALPO Astronomy. And yes, this podcast also has a Facebook page as well. Just search for Observer's Notebook. And if you enjoy what you hear in the podcast and never want to miss another episode, please subscribe. And now, episode 147 of the Observer's Notebook, and we're talking meteor showers. All right, I'd like to welcome everybody back to this edition of the Observer's Notebook, and we're talking meteor showers. And if we're talking meteor showers, that leads us with only one person to talk to, the expert of the meteor shower. Oh, <laughs> Bob, brother. Bob Hunter. <laughs> welcome to the podcast, Bob. Uh, glad to be here. It's exciting times, uh, summertime in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, no more going out and freezing your keister. Got nice <laughs> warm weather, maybe a few mosquitoes, but uh, hey, nature's fireworks is on display. There you go. And, and we have a few meteor showers to talk about. We do, but if most people look at the calendar and the moon phases, they're going to say, oh my gosh, full moon on August 12th, uh. <laughs> coinciding with the Perseid Max. Yet, believe it or not, With a full moon in the sky, the activity will still be better than 95% of the other nights during the year. If you can find clear skies and hopefully transparent skies, you can see it's up to 20 an hour uh, during the wee morning hours uh, during the Perseids with a full moon. Wow. All you need to do is put the moon at your back. And get comfortable in your old lawn chair and, you know, face, face toward the north. Mm-hmm. Look, about, look about halfway up. And like I said, between the hours of 2 and 4, you should be able to count at least 20 an hour. Now, if you have hazy skies, the full moon's glare is going to be in the entire sky, no matter where you look. So that's going to reduce those figures at least in half, if not worse. So us folks out west, we have uh, the advantage of going up to the mountains where the air is thinner, therefore more transparent, and the moon and moonlight is you know basically behind us. So uh, that's what I plan to do at least, uh, get up a few thousand feet, and, yeah. uh, get comfortable, sit in the back of my truck, and uh, <laughs> watch the show. There you go. And, and Perseids are fairly bright meteors. Aren't they characteristically? Definitely, definitely. Uh, There's a large percentage of them that are fireballs, meaning they're brighter than Venus. And what's uh, cool about them is they really display vivid colors and often leave a persistent train that lasts up to five seconds after the uh, meteor's gone. Oh, wow. And you know what I've found out? 
watching this shower during a uh, full moon. I've seen some really exotic colors that I'd never seen in dark skies. Uh, there was one year on a on 6,000 foot level of Mount Laguna. I was seeing pinks and purples and all kinds of stuff. And no, I didn't have a bottle of alcohol with me. Or anything. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really fascinating. So, yes, the numbers will be re- reduced compared to what you normally see. But I tell you, the ones you're going to see are, are usually pretty, pretty spectacular. Huh, fantastic. Okay. I will, I, I will not waste a full moon night. Definitely not. Not, not with the Perseids. Okay, great. I need, to, I need to tell you guys something, though. And even the expert <laughs> can get messed up on this. Uh, since the Earth, uh, it, uh, the orbit is 365 uh, uh, days and six hours. That six hours pushes the maximum uh, six hours later is each passing year. That's the reason we have leap years. So in the past two years, the Perseids have peaked on August 12th, which I think is printed in all the books. This year, it's going to peak on August 13th, oh. universe, universal time, that is. Okay. So the best time to watch for these would be Friday night, Saturday morning, August 12th, uh, 13th. Okay. So Friday the 12th and, uh, and Saturday the 13th. Okay. So the the IMO was predicting the exact maximum to occur at one uh, one hour universal time, which corresponds to uh, six p.m. our time. That's a little too early. It'll, the sun will still be up right. for us on, on the Pacific coast, but uh, for the people in the eastern half of North America. Uh, they can see some activity. Unfortunately, at that time of night, the Perseid radiant light lies just above the northern horizon. So a good chunk of these meteors will be hidden hidden by, uh, by the horizon. But uh, the ones you see at that time of night will be called Earth grazers because at that time, they can only penetrate so deep into the atmosphere and they tend to last longer and create these long streaks in the sky so it could be uh, it could be a, a good show so f- for the most most folks they would rather be out there watching between nine and midnight anyway than us crazy people are out there between two and four <laughs> now <laughs> since the moon is full would trying to capture them with a camera be useless or no, 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 you'll just you'll just have to limit your your exposure. Okay, uh, more than you uh, would in a dark sky. You'll probably have to limit it to probably fifteen seconds or so. Okay, uh, it all depends on how fast your lens is and and how how large of a field of view you have. But no, definitely not impossible. Okay, so uh, if you can set yourself up with an automatic uh, camera uh, that will advance your frames every 15 seconds go for it uh, you'll be surprised w- of, of what you get sounds good so um that's really nice being on on a friday evening saturday morning um i'll probably do an early shift take a little nap and and then get up and and watch the uh, the remainder of the shower hopefully if it stays clear i'm very being being very optimistic <laughs> you know you never know what you're gonna get That's true. but but if it happens to be cloudy the night of maximum the shower is also also a good provider of activity the day before and the day after so uh thursday night friday morning is a good time and saturday evening and uh, and sunday morning will be a good time the uh the rates the rates fall after maximum by about 50% per night. So uh, Sunday morning, I, I expect probably sees 10 per hour and then down to five uh, on, on Monday. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's still well worth it to be the Perseus. Okay, and you so got to you got to so Saturday, Saturday morning after two o'clock in the morning, then probably the ideal time to start looking. Uh, that that's when you'll see the most activity. Okay. 
Uh, for those who want to observe in, in decent hours between, let's, let's say, 9 and midnight, you'll see maybe only 5 per hour. Uh, but those will be very impressive meteors called, called the Earth Grazers. Yep. The other ones will be normal, but uh, you never know. You might see a fireball now and then. So uh, well worth it. And believe it or not, Perseids are actually starting this week. Uh, wow. the rate, they're raised are only one or two per hour. And, uh, this, this shower continues all the way till the end of August. Uh, but we're just entering the fringes right now and it'll be increasing slightly as we pro uh, progress through July and the dark period in the last, uh, uh, last few days of July is a good time to watch them too. Uh, besides, there'll be a lot of activity in the southern skies. If you're looking toward the south, you'll see probably about five uh, Perseids per hour shooting from behind, shooting into your field of view. And uh, that, that's always kind of cool. And uh, after maximum, when the, when the moon is uh, waning, you'll have a small window of opportunity uh, between nine and midnight before the before the moon rises uh, to view in some dark skies and uh, like you know the, the rates will be uh, reduced but still uh, they'll be there and uh, you never know what you, what you'll see okay and, and what's the, where's the parent object for the Perseids? it's a comet swift tuttle okay which uh, which has a godly uh period of about 125 130 years I, I forgot the exact mm -hmm. but uh it was last seen in 1992 and won't be around until uh 21 something so uh okay. it's a long time it was discovered in uh, in 1862 and uh between that time and 1992 uh it was not seen so mm -hmm. but uh it uh, it came back to the inner solar system in 92 and the perseids around those years were really spectacular uh we were getting rates up to 400 an hour in 1993 and 94 yeah i think i remember so, that so uh that that sparked a lot of interest in uh in meteor astronomy in fact during that time uh the uh, observers in the USA were the most active in the world. Uh, we all used to send our, our observations to the IMO, who kept a tally, this massive book every year they produced of uh, observations. And in the early 90s, the uh, USA led the world in observations. Hmm. But uh, then people found out the leanids are, are coming <laughs> about uh, five years later, and the whole world jumped on board. Nah. And uh, while we were still active through that time, uh, all these young folks in Germany and, and, uh, and France got on board and uh, knocked us out of first place. But what the heck, the, the more observations, the better. There you go. Now, since uh, we're talking about the entire summer, there is a dark period uh, during the last 10 days of July uh, when the moon is is waning and it'll be in the morning sky but shouldn't be too bad it reaches new moon on july 28th during that time the uh major shower called the southern uh, delta uh aquarius are active now this one if if you go to the best place on earth to see it which is just south of the equator you can see up to i'd say 30 an hour which isn't too shabby. Mm -mm. Now, the problem we have here in the USA is we're too far north and the radiant only rises about, oh, 30 to 40 degrees, depending on your exact latitude. So under those circumstances, you're probably restricted to only 75% of the activity. And if your skies are hazy, you can knock off another 25%. Wow. So... Uh, most most folks who observe this shower see around 15 an hour at, at maximum. And these meteors are on, on average fairly dim. And the exact night of maximum is debated, but it will occur on a weekend uh, on Saturday the 30th and Sunday, July 31st. Okay. So that's nice and convenient. The moon will be, like I said, new uh, two days earlier. 
So no, pro no problem with the moon. So for that one, you will definitely want to face south. And at that time, um, the uh, planet Saturn will be very close to the uh, radiant of the southern uh, Delta Aquarians. So if you happen to know where Saturn is in the sky, uh, look about 10 degrees to the lower left, and that's where these meteors will be shooting from. Fantastic. And it won't be the only one active that night, too. Uh, during that em uh, entire period, there's a there's a shower called the Alpha Capricorns. Now, this one isn't as strong as the southern uh, uh, Delta Aquarius, but it's known for producing fireballs. And everybody likes fireballs. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the, the drink or the, oh, no. Wait, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it might be a little too warm for, for the drink. <laughs> Fi the fireball tastes much better during a gym and a shower when, it's oh, okay. like, when you need to warm up. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. But, but anyway. I'm note, the, note the self. Okay. There you go. There you go. Um, these are called the Alpha Capricorns because Radiant happens to be on the night of maximum just north of that double star, uh, Alpha Alpha Capricorn. So that's kind of, kind of, oh, I would say maybe 15 degrees, maybe 20 degrees uh, to the to the west of where Saturn is in in eastern Capricornus. So uh, they're far enough to, to easily tell them apart. And the velocity of these two showers is, are, is fairly uh, significant. The uh, alpha Capricornus are slow, tend to last up to a second or more, whereas the uh, delta Aquarius are faster and tend, tend to be fainter. Now, you forget if you have dark skies, you can also add about uh, a dozen random meteors uh, to your count uh, each hour during during the early morning hours. So if you're seeing 15 Aquarians, five Capricornids, and a dozen sporadic, so you got some pretty good totals there. Hmm. So, and we really encourage people to try and uh, differentiate between these showers and, and record it. And the, uh, the IMO has a website where you can actually uh, submit your observations and they're stored there uh, for, for, for safekeeping. And, you know, and re researchers can access these and uh, see who saw what at what time which is really convenient. Uh, a lot of folks like me have data going all the way back to the 1980s uh, on, on that website. So it's really, really a convenient way to uh, store your observations. Now, why would you want to tell one meteor from another? Well, it helps us uh, define the orbits uh, of, 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 of these uh, meteors and uh, tells us the, uh, the, the density and what we basically can expect in the future. Um, for instance, the Alpha Capricorns are weak now, but uh, we've projected uh, the, uh, the parent comet, which is happens to be 169P NEAT, uh, and it apparently really suffered a massive disintegration some time back, and that big cloud of dust is moving closer to the Earth year by year. Now, it's not going to increase the rates anytime soon, but the forecast in 200 years is that the Alpha Capricorn is, will become the strongest shower in the sky and wow. may, may even produce uh, rates of 1,000 an hour at, at maximum. Huh. Now, that, that doesn't blow your mind. <laughs> well, what, 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 when is that, did you say? Uh, unfortunately, 200 years from now. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, I was going to uh, put it on my calendar. I don't think I'll do that. <laughs> well, you can always be hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we like to monitor these, these mm -hmm. meteor showers uh, to see to you know, see what the current activity is, and we compare that to the past, and that kind of tells us what we can look for to in in the future. Now, now, how exactly would you do that? Myself, I don't like to get when I get comfortable. I don't like to get up and down, and, and so I have a, I have a digital recorder 
that I just read my data into. And the following morning, I'll just write all that into my uh, observing form. Okay. So what I record is my location, the date, the time of my uh, observations, beginning, uh, any breaks, the end time. Uh, plus, I also uh, write down the uh, or record the uh, the time of each meteor, and uh, and all of this is also on the IMO form that you fill out. So what you record there, you can transfer it to their form okay. uh the most important thing to do is is try to uh, differentiate between the meteors you see now during late late uh july if you're facing south uh you want to just either decide if it was a south delta quarried or a, a, a alpha capricorn or just a random and believe it or not there are about half a dozen more more minor showers active during that time so you have uh, weak activity from Draco, you have weak activity from Pisces Austrianus, and uh, even even some radiating into uh, into Pisces. So, okay. uh, so they're what, all over. So what you might look at as a random meteor could actually be related to one of those. Yes, things. most definitely. Okay. And I'm the type of person that hates to write down a sporadic you know because mm. all these meteors at one time belonged to a shower but oh. unfortunately that shower is dispersed and it's unrecognizable un now but you know i i i have all the active showers that are possibly act uh visible that night and i try to classify as many as i can you know still i'll get a lot of sporadics but uh, if i can see you know two or three Pisces Austrianas uh, during an session, I'll be really happy. Okay. All <laughs> That's right. three, three less no name meteors. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, it me and it means a lot. So uh, that that's the most important report of your, your part of your report. And now it also helps us to record the magnitude. Um, th that's pretty difficult because um, it ranges from barely visible which are six magnitude you know all the way up to fireball range which is right. in the in the minuses so that takes a lot of practice but if you've been doing as long as i have mm -hmm. it pretty much comes second nature uh secondary information that you record that's not really important but maybe of interest to you is the colors like i mentioned before those crazy colors of the perseids and the fact that if if they leave a uh, five second train you might note that and you can also uh, note the velocity uh that will help you uh, determine whether it was an alpha capricorn or an aquarian hmm. if it was slow most likely would be a Capricorn uh, a little bit faster than an Aquarian. And if it was really fast, like the uh, Perseids are, most definitely that one. I also use something very high tech, uh, which is a, a dark colored shoestring, which I hold up in front of myself. This is about uh, two feet long. And when I, sit, when I see a meteor, I'll put that shoestring right in front of where the meteor path was. Now you're going to ask me, how the heck can you see a dark colored shoestring <laughs> at night? Well, believe it or not, even in the darkest locations, you can see these up, up against the, the sky. It, it's no problem. Okay. And it's less distracting than, than a white one, which are usually very wide, made for tennis shoes. Right, right, right. <laughs> so you want something thinner. And what I do is I line that up and I go backward and that will tell me if it came from that particular radiant or not interesting so although i may have not seen the start of a perseid meteor if i line it up and then follow it if it comes from perseus by golly it's one if it doesn't uh, then, it's, then it's random so i need to add black shoelaces to my toolbox definitely okay. bring us Bring a set of them in case, right. you, in case you lose them. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> oh, shoot. Well, anyway, I wanted to add one more minor shower uh, that occurs during the Perseids and peaks just a few days after. It's called the Kappa Cygnets. It's not very well known. In fact, we don't really know the exact radiant because this 
uh, this seems to be a combination of, of, of at least two showers, if not more. But all the radiance uh, re, uh, come from uh, all the radiance, all the meteors <laughs> come from the area around Kappa uh, Cygnus, which is pretty close to the head of Draco. And this one is best seen as soon as it gets dark, unlike most meteor showers. Now, after the Perseids, the moon won't rise until uh, 10, 11, and midnight, depending on how many days after. But uh, that'll give you uh, several hours to try and see these. These meteors are extremely slow, uh, much slower than the Alpha Caps, and they also are uh, producers of fireballs. So that's that's one nice thing. So you may have gotten shut out for the Aquarius and even the Perseids, but if you have a clear stretch of uh, weather right after the Perseids, you might give this uh, the shower a chance. Um, I've 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 seen several fireballs; they're spectacular, and you know what? It's it's kind of nice to uh, to be out during that time of night. Uh, the it, it, it's funny. It seems that the the even the crickets sound sound different. <laughs> funny, funny. Now, well, you anyway, ma- you mentioned the um, the IMO, the International Meteor Organization. Their website is uh, www.imo.net. Tell us, dot, tell me a little it, bit about it, that it, group. It's dot dot uh, org actually. Oh, oh it's dot org. No, 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 wait a minute. No, wait a minute. You're right. It's it's, it's not, net. That's what I, I got thought. that mixed up. I got that mixed up with AMS. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was formed back in 1988 for for the sole purpose of having everybody supply data in the same format. Prior prior to that, each individual media club had their own way of, uh, of interpreting a media activity, and they would record it in different methods, and it was impossible to to combine the data to see exactly what happened globally. And the IMO was an attempt to get everybody in the same standard and to uh, so we can basically find out uh, how the activity occurred worldwide. And uh, there was a lot of resistance because, uh, you know, people were set in their ways. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but over time, uh, most people have have, have uh, accepted accepted the IMO and their methods, and uh, it's it's done wonders. There's been some wonderful uh, um, analysis of all these showers, and when, when you have data from across many time zones, you can actually see. Uh, uh, different peaks in, in showers. Uh, we've we found out that the Perseids have a double peak about six hours apart uh, mm. during a few years. And lo and behold, the Perseids last year blew us away because a lot of us that missed the, the maximum were out two, uh, two nights later. And this outburst occurred for several hours that surpassed the maximum. So it, it, it was really crazy. Hmm. Uh, and and that just happened to be only visible uh, in the North American uh, theater, so <laughs> okay. we we lucked out for that. So, but uh, yeah, the goal is the IMO is to have the same standard so everybody can uh, contribute to their database, and it's an open database. Researchers can go in there and browse to their heart's content and you can see which all your buddies in germany or even mm. australia are, are seeing and uh believe it or not the uh perseids are visible in, in australia <laughs> 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 only only for a couple hours a night uh, in august and of course they're all bundled up because it's, it's winter down there but uh, they are visible and we have received uh observations of, uh, from them so okay. Now, when you receive obs- do you do you receive uh, observations directly, or do you just go right to the IMO to see what's happening? Um, hopefully, our members of, of the Alpo will uh, will uh, share their observation with me, and okay. I will also encourage them to uh, to uh, 
yes, you know, fill out the, the form on the IMO webpage. Now me, I'll take them in any format because right. I, I'll, I'll decipher them. Now, you know, the, the IMO has to be a little more strict in, in, in how they accept things. But uh, once you, once you get used to it, 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 it's not, it's not a big deal. Okay. And, and believe it or not, I keep forgetting to tell you this during last year's Gemini's, I had uh, several new observers that contributed data and. Oh, fantastic. And I'm going to remind them to, to go out for the Perseids, even though it's, it's moonlit. So uh, you're doing a good job there, Tim. Well, good. Well, you're doing a good job, too. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's these are some of the most popular podcasts I do. And, you know, it's it's and they're, they're always different. That's the thing. I mean, we'll talk about Perseids one year and then the next year it's a completely different conditions that, that we're observing in. So right. it's, it's uh, good to have these up. There. Now, you have a do you have a. Uh, a number of observers that are consistent with sending you observations. Yes. Yes. Uh, you want to give a shout out to them? <laughs> sure. Uh, well, one of my favorites is a Rocky Togni who's been with me. He's in, he's in Arkansas. He's been with me since I took over this job back in roughly 1990. Wow. And he, you know, he doesn't get out much, but what he does, he sends me quality work. And I just love him for it. So, uh, Rocky, if you're listening, keep up the good work, buddy. Fantastic. And there's uh, there's another one in Texas, uh, Terrence. Uh, Terrence, he's been uh, fairly new, mm-hmm. and uh, he he blows me off the, off the map. He is out so many times a year. And uh, he lives in West Texas, where it's nice and dark, and mm-hmm. it's more desert than than it is uh, the weather you get off the off the Gulf. So he has uh, dry, dark skies, and uh, you know, it's outstanding. There are a couple more. Um, Mark Adams, who was a major uh, role player in the uh, AMS during the. During the 1980s, he okay. he actually is a professional astronomer. Oh wow! And I worked at McDonald Observatory uh, in the 90s, <clears throat> and uh, talk about some quality data. Boy, he uh, he he does a great job there. Fantastic. And uh, you know, I used to have several local, but. Uh, you know what? As, as time goes on, uh, we all have uh, different interests. And, right. You know. You know, it's just not quite as easy to get up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's certainly not like the days back when the Leonids were uh, you know, right. were were active. So, uh, but that's what we're here for. We're trying to drip up uh, you, uh, new and young people, to get interested in this. Yeah. And uh, you don't need pricey instruments. Uh, just be outside, get comfortable, and watch nature's fireworks. That's right. Grab your lounge chair, your hot chocolate, and the blanket, and and, Amen. and a way to record your data. And you could easily use your cell phone for that because cell phones do have recording. Yes. Capabilities, and you have an accurate clock right there, too. So that's most, always a good tool to have out there. Most definitely. Yeah. Fantastic, Bob. We got anything else to share before we let you go? No, but I got a teaser for our next podcast. Uh oh, uh, the the Orionids uh, mm-hmm. will peak under good conditions, and they're always uh, interesting shower to watch. And just about ten days after the Orionids, we are expecting a swarm of tarred fireballs. Now, swarm is in the same context as meteor shower. Uh, it's not going to be crazy, but you're going to see a lot more fireballs than normal. Of course, they're going to be spread out during the entire night, but this happens about once every seven to five to five to seven years. And, uh, it peaks right around Halloween and lo and behold, I'm going to get a ton of fireball reports at that time, Fantastic, (laughs) especially with the, the kids outside at night. Oh yeah. So, uh, but. It seems that Jupiter ha- causes the orbit of Comet Anki to push particles closer to the Earth at mm-hmm. certain times, and uh, the year 2022 happens to be one of those. And the, the last time this happened, I believe, was 2016, and 
the the fireballs were just crazy we were we were getting reports up to 300 uh 300 reports a night uh, now, a lot of those were the same fireball but still uh, yeah. the, act, the activity was was really impressive Fantastic. and and these these fireballs are all slow and very colorful so uh we i i better shut up now and save some of that for, yeah. <laughs> for our next podcast that sounds good bob <laughs> well again i want to thank you coming on and talking to us about meteor showers it's always entertaining my pleasure and i look forward to our next one all right clear sky Well, that'll do it for this episode of the Observer's Notebook Podcast. Again, I want to thank Bob Lunsford for coming on and giving us a very interesting discussion about the upcoming summertime meteor showers. And I also want to thank the listeners that have stepped up and helped contribute to the meteor section. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And meteor observing is fun. Everybody get out there and give it a try. We upload new episodes of The Observer's Notebook on the 1st and 15th of every month. You can subscribe to us on iTunes. If you do, please rate and review it. I really appreciate that. And you can also listen to us on Apple Radio, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Google Play, Stitcher, Amazon Echo, Spotify, and we're also available on our ALPO YouTube channel. You can help support the podcast by donating to it via Patreon by giving up to $35 a month, where you'll receive one year's membership to the Alpo and producer credits. And with that, I want to thank the producers of this podcast, Steve Seedentop and Michael Moyer, for their generous support of The Observer's Notebook. The link for Patreon, as well as the link for the Alpo, is in the show notes. And if you'd like to get a hold of me, my email address is cometman at cometman.net or on Twitter at, at ObserversNBPod. Until next time, my hope is you always have clear and steady skies. Thanks for listening.